remember David, the king of Israel, said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, not seen begging for bread. What have we got to worry about today? Just cast our care for us. Let's turn to page 311 in our hymnal. We're going to sing, we'll understand it better by and by.
Lord, I pray that you'll bless this offering. Amen. Oh my soul, 
worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I will worship your holy name. There's going to be three verses to it. And to what extent you don't know, just watch the words. It will help you learn it. If you know it, then sing like never before. Amen? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
You know, there was a time in my life I was just always fearful of backsliding uh, because I did it so much. I mean, let's just be honest. Uh, when we're young Christians, uh, we flop all around sometimes before we get our feet stable. And uh, I realized in time that was not the Lord's fault at all. It had nothing to do with the fact that He didn't like me so much. It's just as I didn't know Him very well. Amen? The more you know the Lord, the more confidence you have because you realize that you are resting on His Word. You're resting on His promises. And you're doing your part, but He's the one that's giving you strength. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I've asked my wife to leave one more song.
Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. And sometimes in the difficult situation and in the hard time, we can just lift our hands, our eyes, and our hearts. And praise can flow out of us like a river. That praise creates a seat for the Holy Spirit to just move right in. To help you no matter where you are or what you need. And I know that this is just a building, but this is our church. And your church can be in your living room sometimes. Sometimes in your bedroom. I don't know. I make church anywhere I want to have church. But I can tell you the presence of the Lord is here just hope. create a seat for him, a seat of praise that we've created fighting him in it. He just wants to move right in. He doesn't want you to struggle. He doesn't want you to be sick. He doesn't want you to be unhappy unless you're unhappy because you're a sin. He wants you to have joy and peace and contentment and healing. And if we could create that seat for him today, we're standing in his presence on the whole
he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. But sometimes he just moves in a precious way. And I think it's just a little tiny taste of heaven. Amen. Heaven is going to be so wonderful. I'd say I can't wait to get there, but I can wait a little bit. But I know that it's going to be worth the journey. Amen. Okay, I think I'm switched over now. Okay, they say that I need. If you would, you can turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to preach a two part sermon this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning. So if you're a small, you get both of them. You say, well, what's a small? A small is a Sunday morning only. We love Sunday morning only, but we sure love it when you come other services too. And sometimes I've had a tendency to break up a sermon and bring it back in the evening, and then people that are only able to come in the morning miss it. So this morning I'm going to break up this message into two sections, uh, and I will finish it next Sunday. What's it called? I don't know what it's called message, but I can tell you what it's about. It's about transformation. Transformation. Well, you know what transformation is. That's when that little caterpillar goes swimming around and shoots out all that gooey gooey and it turns hard and crusty. Next thing you know, it breaks out as a butterfly. That's a transformation. Doesn't look like it did before. Doesn't act like it did before. In fact, it does some things it could never have done before. Okay, am I? It's not on? Wow. I sound so loud to myself. Oh, it says mute right here. Let's unmute it. Try it now. Hopefully we're in good shape. <coughs> Transformation. That is God's will for your life. In fact, it's not only God's will for your life, but it's God's ongoing will for your life. In other words, transformation isn't simply a moment in time for you as a Christian, but it is a process where you are being transformed, according to the scripture, into the image of God's Son. Now that's King James wording, but it just means you'll become more and more like Jesus. That's what I want. I want to become more and more like Jesus. So transformation. It's about transformation. But more than simply about transformation, this morning I want us to look at some specific promises that should encourage you in your walk with God to be transformed. Now, we sang standing on his promises. And the question is, is that just something vague? Do I reach over when I wake up in the morning and flip the Bible onto the floor and jump out of bed and stand on it and say, there, I did it again? No. Standing on His promises is about being specific and being intentional. And so this morning we're going to find four promises that will help you when it comes to being transformed. Why do we need help? Because, Jeremy, sometimes people get discouraged and they almost want to give up with the Lord because they don't see what they want to have happen in their life. And so we have promises. Now, there's more than one kind of promise in the world. I can promise you this morning, after I'm done coughing, I can promise you this morning I'm not going to preach this entire message today. I'm going to break it up. You don't have to do anything for me to do that for you today. I mean, I'm just going to break it up. That's all there is to it. But there are some promises that a person can give that are conditional promises. So when I called my wife up, she wasn't my wife then, and I said to her, I am coming to St. Louis and I'm going to ask you to marry me. And if, that's the condition, if you say yes, I will move out there. When I came to St. Louis, that promise was as only as good as her response. But when she said yes, which wasn't exactly verbatim, now was it? 
She said, I guess. <laughs> when she agreed to the terms of the promise, I went home to Maryland. I turned in my two-week notice, and two weeks later, I moved out here. That was a promise. Now, promises are wonderful, but do you realize that not all promises are worth very much? I know parents that are scum of the earth parents. That's a terrible thing to have to say, but it's true. And they promise their kids things, and they have no intention to keep their word. And they, so the kids go excited about something, and then I'm sorry, something more important than you came up. Everything's more important to you, but I'm not going to tell you that. Sometimes we have to get blunt. <laughs> and promises are made and never fulfilled. But do you realize that when God makes a promise, you can put it in the bank? It's a good promise. He will always keep his promise. So some of his promises are unconditional. And some of his promises are conditional. But all of them are good promises. So let's look at what the Bible says. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter is written when Peter is about to die. He knows he's about to die. He's probably in prison. It doesn't explicitly say, state it. But in 2 Peter, he's looking towards death. He sees death coming. He might be in prison. He's got some last things to say, and they're important. And this is what it says. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. That's some good multiplication. When you can multiply grace and peace. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall never, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when you read that, sometimes you need to read something more than once. There is so much packed into those 11 verses. You could probably read that about five times a day, all week long, and come back and want to do it again. It is so full of stuff. But at the core of it is a life of victory can be yours. A life of victory can be yours. God has made an abundant provision for you and for me so that we don't have to walk defeated. We don't have to walk in the bondage of sin. We don't have to walk with discouragement as our companion. We can have 
the things that God has given us because there are exceeding great and precious promises. Now, when the apostle starts this out, he uses a little phrase. The phrase is, like precious faith. Like precious faith. I'm going to tell you why I like that little phrase, and then we're going to jump into the promises. When Peter is writing his letter, he's not writing it to Paul the Apostle. He's not writing it to any of the other disciples. He's not writing it to John the Beloved. He's not writing it to Matthew. Uh, he is writing this to just the church in general. It's to people like you, people like me. But when I look back through time, and I have God's word, and I see the apostles in my mind, what I tend to do is this. There they are. They are so high, lifted up. Look what they accomplished. It started with just those 12, and they turned the world, Becky, upside down. That's back up, for those of you who don't know. Turned the world upside down. But when he says that we have a like, precious faith, what he is saying is not only is our faith precious because God has done something wonderful for us, but he says your faith is just like my faith. The quality of faith that I have is the quality of faith that you have. And what God can do through me, God can do through you. Now God has a different plan for your life than me. But with the same kind of power that is underneath of Peter, the apostle, he's saying that is like your faith. You don't have some second-rate, puny, miserable faith that God gave you, but to certain elite people, he gave them the good stuff. No. We have like, precious faith. And so when I realize that, when I think about great people that have went before me, or great people that are before me, that I see, and I look at their faith, I realize that what God did for me can produce the same stuff yes. as them. I can have faithfulness as my hallmark to my life. Faithfulness. I can have godliness as the characteristic that people recognize me by. I can have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance just like everybody else because it's the same Holy Spirit that is working in me that works in them. So when I see fruit in other people's life, I don't just stand back and go, oh, but that's them. I have like faith. It's precious because it can accomplish so much. Four promises. Number one. The first promise that we have is that we are given everything we need. We are given everything that we need. That's verse number three. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all, everybody say all, all, all things. <laughs> he hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto virtue and glory. If you're following along, it's glory and virtue. That was what he has called us to. So, we have three parts to this. First of all, what we are given. We're given everything. But it's not just simply everything, everything. It's everything that pertains to life and godliness. So, I can stand up today and say, Lord, let $100 bills rain from heaven on my head because you said that you have given me everything. But I need to put it in context. He's given me everything that I need for life and for godliness. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. So the first one is life. 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 He promised to give us life. He promised to give it to us more abundantly. And I'm going to guess that this is the kind of life that Peter's talking about. An abundant life. This life that God gave me. Because God gave me the very breath that I have. He created this 
life. He created your life. You might look like you came from a monkey, but you didn't. You came from God. He created you. He gave you the life that you have, and now he gives us everything that pertains to the life of faith that we are going to walk. He gives me everything. He created the life, and now he's going to give me everything I need for this life of faith. Life is an all-encompassing word. It's a pretty broad word. What's going to happen in my life? Well, everything that happens in my life is going to happen in my life. So God has given me everything I need for everything that happens in my life. That's pretty big. So if trouble comes my way, God has given me what I need to go through the trouble and to rise above. If blessings come my way, the Lord is able to come through and help me to be a blessing to others. No matter what it is that comes my way, the Lord has given me everything I need to go through everything in this life. Praise the Lord. And beyond this life, life eternal. He's given me everything I need for life eternal. When you go back and you look at the Greek word here for life, one of the ways that they used this word was to mean your lifestyle. God has given you everything that you need for the style of life that you are going to live as his child. And that ties in with the next part because he's given you everything that you need for godliness. Godliness. What is this godliness? Well, what we want it to mean is that when I got saved, the righteousness of Christ was given to me, and so the Lord gave me all of that. That's not what this means. I mean, that is. That, that's, that's holiness. There's no question about it. But this word godliness here is holiness in practice. This is holiness lived out in front of everyone. This is when a person looks at you and says, they are godly. That is godliness. I just threw the oil down. I'll pick it back up. There's two verses here that I'm going to give you that help put the word godliness in context. 1 Timothy 2.2 2 says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It's talking about the way you live. Another verse would be Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're talking about my practical daily walk before the Lord. And so, the righteousness that people will see, everything I need for people to say, that is a godly person God has given me. So that means if, as a Christian, I am an ungodly person, God didn't give that to me. I am going contrary to what God has made provision for. God gave me everything for life. God gave me everything for godliness for a purpose. Two purposes, according to this verse. The first purpose is for glory. That's his glory, by the way. When you walk the way God intends you to walk, and you walk by his power, it brings him glory. People will see your life, and they will honor the Lord. That's what glory means there, to honor him. It will bring honor to his name. But it is also for the purpose of virtue. Virtue. Virtue is being excellent morally. It's moral excellence. Virtue. So God has given us life, his life. God has given us his character. That's godliness. God has given us his life. God has given us his character. First of all, it's to honor him. But second of all, it is to portray him to the world. God is working in me to bring glory to him, but also to show him to people through my life. And you know, by certain behaviors that we could engage in, 
It could prevent people from seeing God portrayed through us. And that is why this is so important. But how? How? How can this possibly be? How is it that I could possibly be godly and virtuous and walk with that type of life? And there is only one answer. And that answer is his power. That is the only answer. And that's what it says. According to his divine power. So his power works through me. He gives me everything according to his power, which is enormous, to accomplish everything I need for life and godliness. And why? It is so that I can bring honor to him and it's so that I can portray him to the world. The promise that we stand on is he gave me everything I need. You say, I'm looking for a promise. I need a promise to put my feet on. He gave me everything. He's given me Everything. I receive text messages every so often from somebody from the district, and they sent me one today. I'm half tempted to whip it out and read it, but I'm not. But the, the gist of it was that he was praying that God would give me the key to unlock the ministry that God has here. And I didn't respond. I responded graciously, but I thought, God's already given me the key. The key is to follow the plan he's laid out in his word. I don't have to wonder whether God has given me all that I need. He's already given me all that I need. The question is, will I stand on that promise and will I walk in his power? And if I'm willing to do both of that, I'm going to see it worked out in my life and in my ministry. And the same is true for you as well. Promise number two. We will not fail. Let me back up. That's promise number three. Promise number two. We can have a genuine, supernatural change. See, when we talk about transformation, people try it out in different ways. There are people right now, two blocks down from us, at the Harris house, that are trying to change their lives. They have addictions that are controlling them, and they recognize it's a problem. And they're going through however many steps towards transformation, and they are trying to change themselves. But sometimes it's not enough to try to change yourself. Sometimes you have to have something more. You see, it's possible for a person to come to church and change themselves. That's not the kind of change God wants from you. He wants the kind of change where it is supernaturally empowered change, and that is coming from God alone. The Bible says in verse number 8 there, I'm sorry, verse number 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You know, for the longest time, when I read that passage and I just kind of read through it quickly, I thought to myself, Woo, we've been made partakers of the divine nature because we gave our life to the Lord. But you know, Brother Matthew, that's not what it says. It doesn't say that. What it says here is that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, the Lord has already promised he's given me everything I need. But am I a partaker of those things that he's given me? If I start partaking of the things that he's given me, those precious promises, then all of a sudden the divine nature kicks in and it infuses me and it fills me and I am empowered to live the life that God wants me to live. Now that's a whole world different than trying it on your own. Being made a partaker of the divine nature. Story that I understand is a true story was told many years ago. Crowfoot, he was the chief of the Blackfoot Confederacy in southern Alberta, Canada. And he gave the Canadian Pacific Railway permission to travel on their reservation or on their land from a place called Medicine Hat all the way to Calgary. And in return, for him offering the railroad to go through their land 
the railroad gave him a pass that for the rest of his life, he could take their railroad anywhere it went. At any time he wanted. All he had to do was present the pass. He had a free ride. He was proud of that pass. And he put it in a leather pouch. And he wore it around his neck for the rest of his life. But there is no record that he ever stepped foot on the train. Do you realize that that is like so many Christians? Yeah. Who, when they get saved, so much has been offered to them. And if you're not careful, you just wrap it up in a book. And you just sit it next to your bed so you always have it with you. But the power that is there and where it can take you, you've never jumped on the track. You're still walking it. You're hoofing it. You're walking with your own two feet. It's not what God wants for your life. He wants you to be a partaker of the divine nature. Let's partake of that divine nature. Amen. Let's stand on his promises. Let's walk in the power of it. And if we're going to do it according to that verse, verse number four, we have to resist this corrupt world and its lusts. Now, there's a very narrow definition for lust. If any man lusts after a woman, he's committed adultery in his heart. It's a narrow definition. But in this case, it's a very broad definition. And the definition of the lust here is any desire that is not God's desire. It is contrary to his law. It's contrary to his will. And so the world is corrupt. Why? Because they are walking contrary to his will. They're walking according to their own desires. Do you want to know what we call that? We call that self-expression. I just have to express myself. And there are some communities that are very good at that now. Self-expression. Um, I don't want self-expression. I want to be following after the express image of Christ. I want it to be Him flowing through me, not just my thoughts and my feelings. I don't want it to simply be about being self-pleasing. I want it to be about Christ-pleasing. So the very way that the world operates with self-expression and self-pleasing is different from the way that we are going to operate because we're not going to follow after the corrupt ways of the world. We are going to be infused with power and we're going to be headed in a different direction. Now, I understand that in Canada, the railroad will take you over some magnificent mountains. In fact, you can even take a rail tour that's like a little vacation package where it'll take you through the Rockies up in mountain. I guess in Canada it's still called the Rockies. And you go through the mountains and it's magnificent. Imagine not having a train and you're standing on the slope of the mountain. Which way do you want to walk, up or down? Down. I don't want to walk up, maybe for a little bit, and then I'm going to walk down because it's a lot easier, right? Well, in our flesh, down is easier. But the power of God's Spirit can pull us up the hill and take us to heights that we wouldn't see otherwise. <clears throat> Promise number three. We will not fail. I don't like to fail. I don't like to be a loser. Jeremy, do you like being a loser? Are you sure? Are you positive? Because we've played several games, and I think more often than not, you lose, don't you? <laughs> I just have to say that. You know, when there's four people, all, everybody more often than not loses, you know, <laughs> by, by odds. But nobody likes to be a loser. You don't play to lose, you play to win, right? Well, I don't want to be a failure in my walk with the Lord. And I have seen people that have been failures in their faith. Have you? Sure. The Bible even gives us examples of people that were failures in their faith. Look at Judas. <laughs> Close to Christ and a failure. And so I could just be afraid. A failure. But I have a promise that I can stand on. It's a conditional promise. I don't have to fail. Failure does not have to mark my path. The Bible says, for if these things be in you, which was all of the things that get added into your life. We're going to talk about them next Sunday. If these things be in you and abound, which that word abound is important. It doesn't mean it stays in a tiny measure, but it grows and grows and grows in your life. If these things be in you and abound, 
They make you that you shall ne neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a failure. You don't have to be a failure. <clears throat> God gives us everything we need. But that would be like me going to Walmart and they give me everything I need to have a garden. And then I have all these seed packets. And Brother Matthews, if I don't put them in the ground and water them, then them seeds is potential in a package and that's it. When I get saved, I'm given everything that I need, but it's like potential in a package. And the question is, what am I going to do with this? But if I let it grow, then I don't have to worry about being barren or unfruitful. How can I tell if I'm not growing? How can I tell if I need this passage for myself? I'll tell you how, because you will be barren and you will be unfruitful. I mean, if it promises that that's not what you won't be, then if you don't follow the prescription that he's given us, that's your course. Barren and unfruitful. So the question is, what does barren and unfruitful mean? Well, barren might surprise you on what it means. The word barren means lazy. Woo! If you're a lazy Christian, it's probably talking to you. That's what it means. Lazy. Another thing that this means, ties in with lazy, is idle. You're not doing much for the Lord. You're not doing much for the kingdom of God. It's probably talking to you then. What's the third thing it means? It ties in with if you're lazy and with your idol, useless. If God is not getting any use out of your life, then you are potential that is molding in the bag. God intends for way more for you than for you to be useless and idle and lazy in the kingdom of God. Unfruitful simply means unproductive. You're not doing nothing. Kind of all ties together. So if you're not accomplishing anything and you're lazy in your faith, watch out. It doesn't have to be that way. God gave us promises so that we wouldn't have to fail. We don't have to. What is the secret? If these things be in me and if they abound, I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to end up in that category over there. Promise number four, we will not fall. We will not fall. This morning I stepped out on my front porch. Rain tends to blow in on our front porch and it's concrete and our house is settled just enough that it tips this way towards the house instead of this way. So instead of the water just flowing back off the porch, it just accumulates. And I went out there and I saw that there was ice crystals crusted all around the edge of it. And it was still water in the middle. And I walked out there and I looked at that and I thought, ooh, it looks a little bit slippery. Well, then I went to go do something and I stepped on it. And I went, woo! And I didn't hit the ground, but I almost did. I almost fell. I almost went, that would have been just not so fun, you know? Nobody wants to fall. Falling can be disastrous. Sister Anderson, falling can be disastrous. Falling can be disastrous. Did you know if you fall in your faith, it can be disastrous? The Bible calls it backsliding. You're falling from the grace of God. That could be what happens, but according to the scriptures, we will not fall if you do these things. It's a promise. I can stand on it. I don't have to fall. I don't have to be a failure in my Christian life. It's a promise. It's like when I said to my wife, all you have to do is say yes. And well, you go with God's plan. And then you've got a path of success marked out in front of you. We have to be diligent. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. We have to be serious. We move with eagerness for what God has. The horizons in front of us are glorious. God has great things for our lives. But that is a process right there. This isn't a one time make my calling and election sure. I get up from the altar. I feel like my sins are forgiven. I say, okay, my calling and election is sure. And that's it. That's not what that means. I have to continually make my calling and election sure. And how do I do it? I can examine my life 
to find out if the things that are supposed to abound in my life add to your faith virtue, add to your virtue knowledge, add to your knowledge. You look at all of these things, you look at your life, and you can see whether or not supernatural power is infusing you. You don't have to ask everybody, am I going to heaven? You can know for yourself. You can look at your life and see whether or not the power of God is working and moving through you. <coughs> Add to your vir faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly love and to brotherly kindness charity. Next week we're going to look at all of that. There's something we can do. If we're a partaker of the divine nature, that means I have a part in this. And God has a part, and his promises are sure, and they are in men, and I can bank on them. But the question is, is will I fulfill my part? You see, if my wife wouldn't have fulfilled her part and said, I guess. <laughs> Then I would have went home a broken-hearted person, and that would have been it. I most likely would not be your pastor today. Is that fascinating? Well, if you don't say or do your part with what God has offered you, you will miss out on everything that God has for you. And if you're not careful, you'll miss out on eternal life as well. We got promises that we can stand on. It doesn't have to be that way. I already have confidence in God. Now I have to walk according to knowledge and walk according to His will, His word. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. We thank you, Father, that you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. We don't have to wonder, Lord, whether we can make it through the next day. We already have your promise that no matter what life brings us, you do not leave us or forsake us. And we thank you, God, for that. And we stand upon that, Lord. It doesn't matter what trial or what temptation comes our way. You have given us everything that we need, oh God. We thank you, Lord, not only that you have given us everything that we need, but you will empower us by your spirit. So that a supernatural work occurs within our lives. And we don't have to simply walk in our own strength. But we walk in your glory and in your power and in your might. Let it be your strength that moves through us, we ask, O oh God. Lord, it is our intention in life not to be a failure in our faith. And to not fall out from grace. And we thank you, Lord, that you make a promise to us that that does not have to be the course that we take. And, Lord, we are going to stand on your promises. But we're not going to stand and just stand still. We're going to stand on your word while we move forward in the power and the might of your spirit. And, Lord, as that happens, God, I believe you'll do great things. Because Simon said, Simon Peter said at the very beginning, we have a like precious faith. Lord, help us to realize that the very empowerment that you gave the disciples, you will give to us. Our faith is no less of quality. Hallelujah. Embolden your people, O oh God, to expect great things. May our lives reflect the glory of your Son. In Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you.